Yeah, so I, I was asked by Shandor to actually say a bit about how we use ELNs. And um, you can see here from the, from the first introductory slide, it is about an electron microscopy lab. So it is really a bit specific. I mean, ELNs, as we've heard, um, you, you have to put them into your context and um, out of context, it's just too abstract to learn very much from. So I um, wanted to quickly say a bit about what we do. So we operate electron micros microscopes and they are very versatile. So you can do a number of different experiments, which also makes it a bit difficult, of course, for uh, structured data in an electron, uh, electron uh, sorry, electronic lab notebook, because um, you have very different structures and very different types of experimental data. And yeah, so just to explain to you a bit about our background. So we um, do structure research. So we look at the atomic structure of materials and also a bit coarser than just atomic. And so we operate electron microscopes. We also develop um, additions and modifications and new uh, kind of systems, um, but then invest a lot into data reconstruction algorithms because the data that we acquire is not often humanly interpretable and also do then um, modeling of experiments. And I would like to show you how the electronic lab notebook that we work with, or basically what we're currently still developing. So it's not a final solution that I want to present, but basically what we're currently at. And, and this is, um, as we speak, improving uh, actually quite rapidly. Um, and how we combine that with this environment um, of a research lab at a university. Also, um, the other aspect is that uh, there's quite a number of electron microscopes that are in the facility that we're also in. They don't all basically belong to uh, my group. So we operate a few of those, but it's a collaboration of uh, different institutions that have pooled their microscopes here together. And the aim is really to uh, somehow form a common basis um, where we then also have a common basis for how we manage and handle our data. So you can imagine already from the very diverse set of instruments, they may all have in common that they're working with electrons, um, but that is pretty much it already um, because there are very different experiments you can do with them. You can have in situ experiments, you can have um, uh, surface sensitive uh, transmission and, and so on. Um, so very different experiments. You can do spectroscopy, imaging, diffraction, whatever, and combinations of all those. So what we um, have then started to set up already a while ago was a system and uh, the core of it somehow changed a bit, but um, that you acquire your data at either the microscope or in a specimen preparation lab. So I will show you um, a slide about this. Um, and you then somehow put this on a, um, yeah, on, on a system. So the system initially used to be this electronic lab notebook, eLab FTW. We're now transitioning to also or potentially solely using Nomad. Um, this is something that we will find out which works best and how usable um, the this, this system is. But at the moment, um, we uh, record a number of our data in this electronic lab notebook and also describe data there. And um, uh, then can, the data sets that we like, that we think should be put in it, um, uh, upload them to a Nomad database. And you will hear more about this tomorrow. This doesn't have to be the Nomad system that is globally accessible to everybody. It can also be a local Nomad, so-called Nomad Oasis. Um, and you will, as I say, hear more about it uh, tomorrow um, that only your group or only your institution has access to. And the reason why we do this in addition to having the data in some collection is also because we can then do the processing of this data on the data server directly, which in the case of some of our data that I will show you um, is very important because we run very compute intensive processes on them or end, um, often actually end, um, the data is very large. So data sets of 100 or 200 gigabytes is uh, not very uncommon. So, and then of course you want to interact with this, not only from your instrument that you upload the data from, but also when you're then back in your office processing data, you don't want to have to download 200 gigabytes onto your laptop 
um, you want to be able to process all this on the data. And uh, this is another aspect of these electronic lab notebooks and server-based data management um, that we're uh, very interested in. And that's very important for us at least. So here are a few benefits of doing this. For example, um, using these electronic lab notebooks helps us to organize and archive your own data. Um, instead of just having it on a hard drive in your drawer, you now really have it organized and you're forced to somehow also uh, provide at least a bit of description of your data. And um, that's what we have also started to do already and need to actually complete and finalize um, is that the metadata that uh, is available during the experiment can automatically be uploaded together with your data so that you can, when you afterwards then try to catalog your data, you try to search for things, um, these data are already available um, for search engines um, within your database. Then it also enables collaborations with groups uh, that you uh, have external to your institution, so your collaborators, um, in the case of electromicroscopy um, or other expensive equipment, you often have collaborations where people cannot afford or don't want to um, afford the same instrumentation, but want to collaborate with you. Um, and so that is for us at least a very important aspect, but also collaboration within the group um, where multiple people somehow involved in an experiment or the processing of experimental data. Um, so that is also a very important tool where you don't give somebody a USB stick with your data, but you can just send them an email with a link to the data set, which has all the latest processing and analysis already uh, uh, attached to it. So that everybody is basically immediately on the same page. I found out um, in my group, we have quite a few master and bachelor uh, students. So of the order of between 10 and 20. And um, what I've started to recently do is to actually for every new bachelor student or master student, I create um, an account on this electronic lab notebook. And I then give access to only those people that are involved with this uh, thesis. Um, so the direct person supervising the thesis and myself, and of course the student, and uh, actually this is quite useful because they then have a single place where they can upload all the data that they want to present to the direct supervisor or myself. Um, and there's also, at least with this, uh, with this electronic lab notebook solution, I have a way to actually uh, define steps of what should be done next and so on. So this is actually, of course, there are other tools for this, but in uh, the context of a laboratory where you want to use one common software platform for all your work, um, this actually works uh, very nicely as well. And then I said this already, um, for us, it's very important to actually process and manage large data sets, which you don't want to process offline. So we actually have a compute server with um, really a number of high-end GPUs, which can be then used to process this data, which you wouldn't have available at a desktop or, or even your laptop or whatever device you're using. And you could now even do all these operations from your smartphone. So you don't need to have any um, strong computational uh, power on your desk uh, as long as you can do it on the server. And I will show you actually how this can be done because it actually feels the same as if you would be doing it on your desktop. And um, yeah, so one thing that comes with this is that we also, as I said in the beginning, we also develop methods that um, process data, that do reconstructions and so on. And that are constantly being developed and new versions coming available. If we would um, do this de decentralized, so everybody does the data processing on their own computer, they would always have to update the software. New collaborators would have to install the software. Of course, we're not Microsoft, so we don't make it uh, immediately self-installing on every potential system. So um, having this only on one computer and everybody accesses this computer to do the processing is actually for us a big benefit because we only need to make sure that it works on that system and does it properly. And then it's reproducible for everybody else. Um, that's actually another benefit. Right. Um, as uh, Shando has already said, there will be more um, hands-on details and actually in-depth details on everything I'm going to say today. So 
there will be um, by Jose Marquez, there will be um, uh, basically an introduction or an, yeah, a demo of this electronic lab notebook, the same one that I'm also going to show you today quickly, shortly. Then also how the integration of this electronic lab notebook with Nomad happens. I won't touch that. So I will refer you if you have questions um, to Shajir Shabi. And Marcus Scheidkin is also showing how this um, Nomad is currently being extended to also uh, enable ELN features. Um, and I won't show you any of that as well. So there is uh, a lot more in depth and uh, beyond what I'm going to say information tomorrow. Let me quickly explain the, the workflow that we have. And again, this is specific to an electronic lab, uh, sorry, an electron microscopy laboratory. Um, so we need to prepare our specimen and we can already record first data when we do the preparation um, and look at what has been done under the optical microscope. So this is the first time um, data can be acquired. Uh, binary data, of course, you can also type in information um, uh, if you want, but um, this is, for example, an optical microscope and we use actually the same data acquisition tool. It's an open source software that we also use on uh, at least one or even two of our electron microscopes. So it's the same interface and um, actually Shajir Shabi has programmed a possibility and a plugin to this, which automatically uploads data then to the electronic lab notebook from within the software. It's very specific to our um, uh, well, field of research. So I won't demonstrate this here now, but um, if you have questions, um, you can ask me or Shajir tomorrow um, on this. And then you, ge you, uh, you generate an entry into your electronic lab notebook and um, you can already type in then information or add links to, for example, the source of the data and, uh, or the sample and so on. And you first, uh, your first data is also um, associated with this, in this case, an optical microscope image. And then the workflow continues because with the software, we can then always link to the electronic lab notebook. We can do it directly within the acquisition software. So what we then do on the electron microscope, we can then um, uh, add to the data that we already have from the specimen preparation and upload this again to our database, either the electronic lab notebook or the Nomad um, server, or there's another um, backup server that we have, um, which is uh, also um, designed by one of my group members. And then when you go back to your office and do some processing and analysis of your data, you again can access it from the electronic lab notebook and then upload it um, again uh, together with your modified data. This is the way that uh, we initially thought it would work, but um, this is still what you can do. And this is what you would do for small data. If you have big data, um, that's the image I showed before, you can do all the processing actually directly within the electronic lab notebook. So the second step here where you um, download the data to your, um, to your local computer can actually be skipped uh, and you can actually uh, work directly on the data server um, if, if um, it enables the tools or if it has available the tools that you need for this. And they are quite flexible. As I said, you can have Jupyter Notebooks um, or the same software that I show here. I will, I will demonstrate this in a minute. So I will show you first how to actually use this electronic lab notebook very quickly. Um, and then also how you can actually interface with it um, uh, Mark has spoken about uh, APIs, so um, uh, application programming interfaces, and how this can be done that you can actually access the information you have in the electronic lab notebook directly from your local PC without having to go through the uh, interface. So I hope you can see now um, this uh, web browser. So this is I already logged into um, our electronic lab notebook instance. Of course, there is now a huge number of data sets in here. We don't want to browse through them, but we search for tags. This is the way that uh, this EDAP FTW organizes its data um, by, by uh, not having folders and so on, but having um, tags that you assign to each of your experiments. And then you can search by these tags, which has the, the nice benefit that um, if you have something in the subfolder of a subfolder, you have to go directly there to find it, or you create a link to it somewhere. 
Um, by tags, you can have basically one experiment having multiple tags. So you find it basically in the context of, or in, in a number of different contexts, um, I wanted to say. So this is an experiment and you can see here um, there's some data. This is actually a different electronic microscopy data, at atomic resolution. And you can see there are also some files attached. So some larger and some smaller files. So this file, for example, here, is um, nearly two and a half gigabytes. This is um, a 40 stem image. I will show you in a minute also what that means. Um, and here you have, um, for example, the structure of the material. This is uh, MOS2 that we're looking at at the moment. You can also have some interactivity with this. Um, then the description of the data, uh, your metadata um, can be uploaded in JSON format and you can then um, interact with this JSON file, you can actually really browse your metadata that is very structured. In addition to, um, that's what I showed up here, Oops. this is this free text editing window where you can add free text um, that doesn't uh, fit into the structure that you want to provide down here. Um, uh, uh, paper is going to explain more of these details to you tomorrow. Um, I, one thing I wanted to show, um, if you now want to really have free text and you have an idea of um, what you want to do, for example, you see here, oh, this is an image and there's some something strange here, there's a defect here, you can actually make a note to yourself and you make a screenshot, for example, of this picture here. Um, this is now a screenshot here in my Windows snipping tool and I make a note of this and you can add this to your free text by just going to edit now. And um, you then simply go to the place um, and you say, okay, I'm pasting this in here. And now there's a new image that's pasted in here, uh, which contains, for example, your, your marks. Or you take a screenshot of your experimental setup um, or a picture that you take with a camera or whatever. So you can also do copy and pasting of images and, and so on. Now, the question is, how do you interact with this from your PC? Can you also do uh, interaction differently than going through this web interface? Um, and um, as I said already, there is an application programming interface and that can be uh, done uh, basically from any Python code. In this case, it's a Jupyter notebook, but as long as you have these REST API interfaces, um, you have actually access to uh, most of the data, or actually, if it's a good one, all of the data that is stored. So we can simply here, um, of course, load a few libraries, and that includes also an, a library here that is uh, that I have written uh, or modified. It was written by Shaji and myself uh, that contains information about. Uh, uh, sorry, it, it actually it packages some of the functions um, that you would need to interact with the electronic lab notebook. But you can, for example, download now all the images. So you go through all the images and there's a function here um, that says get all image files and it just looks for the extensions PNG or JPEG in the files. And you can then download them and display them. And you can see here, it also contains now this image that has my annotation in it. That's just images, but of course, um, scientific data is often described differently. Um, definitely your metadata that if you have uploaded it in JSON format, you can also, also now download. Um, I, I specified, maybe I should have said this, I specified a specific experiment here. So this is um, an experiment ID 121. So you find that if you go into your electronic lab notebook and look up the ID, it's actually, if you, I hope you can see this, it's already here in the URL. It's basically the ID that your experiment is um, associated with. Um, and you just enter that ID into your into your uh, Jupyter notebook, and then you access all the data that um, is with it. I showed you that structure file, you know, where you have this interactive display of the atomic structure. You can, of course, also look for a specific file. So I want to actually look at the content of this file that I found with my experimental data. You can also, of course, produce a list of files and then select them within this uh, Jupyter notebook, or you just know what the file name is. In this case, I know what it is and I load it and then I simply display its content. And again, uh, this is just an atomic structure file X, Y, Z coordinates of all the atoms. Um, so you can see, you can interact with these um, electronic lab notebooks either via the, um, via the uh, graphical user interface, the web interface that they provide, 
or you can access the data using the um, API um, from, for example, Python codes, like in this case, or um, uh, also other codes, because it's REST API, there's actually a possibility to access it from pretty much every uh, programming language. Um, I want to go a little bit, uh, show some data processing. And for that, I want to first give you at least a glimpse of what this involves. And so why we think it is important to do this on the server. Um, this is um, an optical microscope image of actually cells, cells in some liquid. So these are live cells and they're not stained. Um, I'm not sure who of you actually uh, has a relation to imaging cells, but um, if you look at these and you try, try to create a high resolution focused image, you don't see very much. So what we then do is we actually acquire images at varying focus. So you can actually control this, the defocus of this microscope here in a, in a motorized way. So you automatically acquire a series at different planes of focus. So this is like detuning the focus of the lens or actually the distance between object and dense in this case. And then you run it through a complicated reconstruction algorithm um, that can actually take hours or even a day, depending on how big the data set is and how powerful your computer is. And um, then you actually get some information about the phase shift of the photons in this, in this material. And this is actually much more information. You can see much more uh, detail and relevant information in here than you could in a normal image. So that is what I mean by we do reconstruction of data. So a lot of the information that we record is not directly interpretable by the human eye. So we need to have the computer make sense of the data before we can actually look at it. And often this is quite a complicated process. Here's another example from an electron microscope where um, this is an organic thin film on some semiconductor substrate um, but only when you do this reconstruction of the phase of the electron wave, you actually see that there's some structure in this. So you can see there's plenty of applications where um, this technique actually reveals information that wouldn't be available otherwise. Uh, here's another example uh, of an SEM. So this is a scanning electron microscope where the beam is scanned across the sample and then the electron beam is deflected depending on the local electric field. And um, we measure this now in, the, in this setup. So we send the beam through the sample and collect the diffraction pattern. And you can then reconstruct, for example, the local polarization in this gallium nitride nanowire or so. Um, there are many different experiments that you can implement using this technique. Again, you have to do a complicated reconstruction. And this is actually a not so complicated. It can be done quickly, so I will show it to you live. But there's also more complex reconstructions which reveal information even at higher resolution than, than this first approach that you can apply. But it's also something where you acquire a huge amount of data. So this example that I showed you has um, two and a half gigabytes. We have data sets with 200 gigabytes. And I'll show you an example of only half a gigabyte of data. So um, let me go again to the web browser to show you how um, this can be done. So. This is the Nomad interface as it looks right now. So I already logged into, and it's one specific page. Um, you have different uh, pages that you can access here. So if you uh, log into it, you can, for example, upload data. So uploading data um, works like here. You can create a new upload where you simply name your, your experiment and then upload different data sets to it. I already have two um, data sets uploaded here. For example, the first one is a focal series. That's what I showed you. Um, it contains um, data in actually a proprietary format. So this is not some common metadata uh, format that uh, everybody would be using, but this is the standard in the electron microscope. Um, be, well, not the standard, but it's a standard that is very uh, widely distributed because the software that acquired this data is uh, very popular. But it's proprietary, so there is no definition actually of this metadata. So some people hacked it and reverse engineered the content to be able to actually then load it. Um, and you can now go, and that is actually, I think a very nice feature. You can now monitor this data and actually interact with it. Um, for example, um, this is the software Neon Swift. I showed you it's this open source graphical user interface for interacting with 2D, 1D, and 3D, and 4D uh, data. And um, if you 
if you open it, it first wants you to create a, a new project. Um, this can be skipped in the future. So this is actually quite recent development. You can maximize uh, this window. And you can see here, it's actually like working on your desktop. So it's within the web browser. I'm not doing this on my PC, but I'm actually working directly on the server where these large data are that could potentially be larger than the remaining disk space on my desktop. And um, I can now uh, download such data. Um, let's see, if, or import, sorry, I import the data sets. You can see there's a folder structure. And I, for example, take this focus series here and I open the focus series. It's uh, actually data provided by Gerardo Silla in my group. It's a focus series of electron microscopy data. So it's, it's only 180 megabytes. It's not so large because it, it contains um, these different frames. You can go through focus and uh, you can then also define a region of interest uh, that you want to do the reconstruction. I won't show you the reconstruction, but um, uh, I'll import a result that was already done. But this reconstruction can then be done directly on the server. So you, there's an interface I can show you. Um, there's a window. Um, for example, here's an interface. You can write different plugins. So this is a plugin that actually a student in our group has written where you can then set up your reconstruction and you can start it then and get a reconstruction result. And the result is here. Sorry. So you can now see also that is the reconstruction result from this uh, region of interest here, where you can then really see information that is otherwise uh, not um, obvious from the data. Where you can also see, for example, here's an atomic defect, which you can then analyze and do all kinds of processing on. I promised you to also process larger data. For example, here the other uh, example data that I've uploaded again in this uploads, but now this other uh, folder here is um, half a gigabyte of data. So it processes a bit more slowly. So I can, so I, uh, I can now um, display that here. And I can now interact with this data. This is a four dimensional data set. Again, um, half a gigabyte, but I can now um, interact with this and I can, um, show to you that I can now, this is, a, is basically scanning different beam positions. So 128 by 128, and I can now change my X and Y indices and look at the local diffraction pattern. This is not very useful information. Um, as a human being, I cannot interpret this very much, but um, I can then now run a processing of this data directly on the server. And it only takes a few seconds and then it has made sense. And what it has done is it has now um, extracted the local electric field from this data. That is the electron beam was deflected due to the local electric field on an atomic scale. And I can now go and uh, look at, oops, sorry. Um, I pressed the wrong button. So I, um, I can now go and, uh, show the two different components of the electric field. So this is the X component and the Y component. And this is now quantitative data that I can analyze. And um, this is also now linked. As you will see, it's linked directly to my experimental data um, where I can now really look at each position within this reconstruction that has been performed and uh, check what does the local data look like? Um, why does this feature appear like that. And so you can really interact with your data um, as you would only normally do on a powerful workstation, um, not necessarily even uh, on your laptop or so. Okay, and um, as you can see here, you can now also uh, from this launch pad, you can now launch also different tools or if some tool has crashed, you can stop it again um, and uh, do other interactions with the same data. And the process data then appears again in, in this upload um, that you generated. So these are tools that we believe are very useful um, for, um, for groups who want to really have advantage or take advantage of the most state-of-the-art techniques that are available, for example, in data processing um, within their fields. Um, I believe that hardly any of you will be electromicroscopists. But um, in your particular area, 
there is going to be similar tools that you think may be very useful for analyzing your data. And they can then be installed in a system like this. So this can be done either um, on the global Nomad um, installation that um, is accessible to everybody worldwide. Um, you will hear more about this by Markus Scheidtken tomorrow. Um, but as I said already, you can also have your local server. And if it's powerful enough um, to process the data that you want to process, um, then definitely this is an option. And then the data is all completely under your control. So you don't have to um, give your secrets away um, without wanting to. And if your server is somehow up to the network, of course, it can also then be shared um, with other people. Um, this is if you upload all the data to this database, of course, the idea is that one can also keep the data and only upload information about your data. So the meta information and have that in a database that people can then search and find and then find information how to access um, the owner of the data and ask for permission to download or whatever um, with that data. And um, with that, I'm actually already uh, at the end of this uh, presentation and I'm looking forward to questions that you may have. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the very nice uh, and very, very exciting uh, presentation. And anyone who has questions, uh, please just uh, uh, raise your hands and then uh, we can just uh, go step by step. Uh, the first one having questions, it's indeed uh, Wolfgang uh, Malzer. Okay, uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Christoph, for that another interesting uh, talk. The question actually is related to your last remark. So I think this is an interesting situation. You, this is a, a really specialized analysis and uh, you offer. And so maybe um, uh, your cooperation partners already have their own library notebooks where they have their synthesis uh, related uh, uh, characterization uh, information uh, there. Do you have already an idea how people uh, tend to use that? Leave uh, the data dis distributed or, or uh, um, prefer they to gather everything on their own server? Um, we, we have just, I mean, if you're referring to this nomad system, I mean, this is quite uh, fresh. Of course, nomad has been around for a while um, in the field of density functional theory. So it's the largest database in, in that area with more than 100 million entries. Um, but it, what, that was very specialized, of course. And um, the data were not as big as, for example, 200 gigabytes. Mm -hmm. So we have just started um, to actually implement all these tools. And we'll see how this pans out. Um, at the moment, storing thousands of several hundred gigabyte data sets is not possible, actually. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. So the idea is that if you want to do this online processing, um, get yourself a powerful server that <laughs> does what you that, that it fulfills the needs that you want, and install Nomad Oasis, basically a local installation of it, and then you can provide you can actually use all these tools. The advantage and why do does Fermat benefit from uh, you having such a system? Um, it's already then in the right format. It has already metadata that is readable and um, accessible um, and can then easily be also, at least the metadata can then easily be also um, uploaded to a public server. Okay, thank, thank you. So uh, I'm so member of, of Daphne, that's uh, mm -hmm. related NFDI for, for Synchrotron. And I think the question will be the same there. Okay, yeah, thank you. Definitely. Yeah. Indeed, in Daphne, you are also working with huge data sets. <laughs> and uh, we will have a workshop next week uh, discussing with Daphne and, and other maybe, colleagues about exactly these problems. Yeah, maybe I should add to this. I mean, there's also, if you're within the NFDI, there's, of course, as you know, no money for infrastructure. So Fermat cannot now afford basically a supercomputer, but that will be something that hopefully can be uh, fixed in a future uh, step with another call. Yeah. Yes, and actually one, one potential uh, answer is that 
you may want to dedicate a small portion of uh, of the uh, of your big cluster uh, so then this can uh, you can make publicly available so you don't have to move your data but anyone who is interested in the public data which is sitting on your server can come and use this small portion so then also the public can take advantage of uh, accessing your data uh, thank you uh, Wolfgang uh, Maita. And then uh, the next uh, person is uh, uh, Volgaten Markus. Markus Volgaten, yes. Yeah, thank you, Christoph. Very nice. Um, I have a question. When, when you compare this new nomad possibilities, is there something similar uh, possible with ELAB FTW? So uh, you know, with having these tools on yeah, a, on a yeah. server instance and uh, putting the data on some server and also do data mining on that server. As you Actually, have just shown. Indeed, that, that is how we first, or I shouldn't say we, um, Shajil Shabi, who is going to give a demo tomorrow, um, that is the way that he has originally implemented it um, as a um, using slightly different technology, so using Guacamole, but this is a tool that should be independent and can also be actually in the future, not yet, and hasn't been tested, but should be also compatible with other sources um, of the data so that you could should be able to do the same also in other tools but that is not my that's not the most recent maybe maybe Markus Scheidken who's also here um, should be able to explain to you exactly how this works what we've done initially was it was based on um, a different technology now it's actually using uh, the Jupyter Hub um, server to actually launch all these different applications I, I can make a very quick remark to this. Um, so the, the, the underlying tool that is running this is, is not normal. It's like this Jupyter Hub, which is a general software platform that allows you to run these remote tools. And what Nomad adds to this, or why we, why we combine this with Nomad, is that Nomad is good at managing the data in terms of who has access to what and, and who is in control over, over what pieces of data. Uh, so when Nomad uses this Jupyter Hub, it basically controls for you uh, who can access this container and what information is available in this container and what information is not available uh, in this container. And thereby we are basically combining these abilities to run remote tools that Jupyter Hub gives us uh, with our data management stuff that we have on the on the Nomad side. So I understand that that this fine tuning of access rights is not available with ELAB FTW. One, one difference definitely is that ELAB FTW doesn't have folder structures for its data. Um, it, it collects all the data in one big bag. And because it wasn't intended actually to manage somehow large amounts of data that you want to store in different folders. Um, so that, that was actually one of the main reasons, at least um, from my perspective, to really do everything now with uh, with Nomad. Yeah, with Elan FEW, we would need to export it from Elan FEW first, put it somewhere, then run the tools on it. And, and uh, with Nomad and this integration, we were able to uh, have everything just once, right? You you have the data on your server, and then Nomad is used to manage it, and, and Jupyter Hub can use it to, to uh, do the analysis uh, on top of that. Um, but tomorrow I can, can explain this much better with demonstrations and stuff. Thank you very much. Next Thank question comes from Martin Albrecht. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice presentation. So I have a question concerning these tools you are using, because what kind of, I mean, you, you for example, showed this center of mass analysis from your STEM data, yeah? So, what is the requirement so you, you can run these tools only on the specific data or, for example, if you have other STEM data, which would be in principle contains the same information, could you run your tools also on them or how do you do this? Um, well, so the data has to be your data, right? So I yeah, don't it's have quite access to, okay. But 
Yes, of course, any any 40 stem data. So they can even okay. be in different formats. So the software okay. needs also, for example, uh, DM3 or um, other formats. So that's what I mentioned, yeah. That's what I, yeah, yeah. So actually that's that's another feature of this um, software, this Neon Swift that it actually reads quite a few different data formats, okay. including DM3 and uh, I'm believing also um, FEI uh, yeah. formats. Okay. So, but this is this is tool which you're using is in principle this Nyan Swift, yeah, which is this, this is working on this Jupyter, Jupyter notebook and this then operates on the data, yeah. So actually, um, the second demo I showed you did not mm -hmm. involve any Jupyter notebooks. So okay. this this what the screen here shows is you could okay. have I could have launched a Jupyter notebook. Yes, okay. Or I'm launching something else, but I can okay. also launch Neon Swift directly. So it really okay. launches now Neon Swift on the server, and okay. you can provide your own Docker container that contains okay. your favorite software. Of okay. course, uh, on the public server, you can only make um, open source software or software that you have the license to do this okay. uh, available. If mm -hmm. On your local system, you can even do that with some software that you haven't needed on Google for. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And indeed, in, uh, in Nomad, there is also uh, the management uh, rights uh, for each person logging in. So that means that, in fact, uh, there is no reason why this cannot be uh, also uh, connected. That if you have licenses, you log in as yourself, who has license to, to run certain stuff. So then this stuff can be then run for you. Whereas others who doesn't have the license, they won't have access to, uh, to these features. I think that uh, would also be uh, possible uh, to, to be implemented. The next question comes from uh, Bernd Rennighaus. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christoph, for this beautiful presentation again. I have a short question uh, concerning the meta dating of the of the experimental data that you have, and you were referring to that in the beginning of your presentation. You said you can actually, together with the experimental data, you can insert the metadata. Is that uh, the question? Is is that done automatically, or have you do it manually by, as you had shown, editing this JSON file, for instance? Uh, that would be that would be question one and question two would be how could you possibly combine metadata as for instance those that are being stored within the dm3 data and additional ones that you would like to add yeah so this is um in, in, in what i uh, was referring to was it's done automatically so the metadata that is acquired with your in your particular software so in this case, it was Neon Swift um, that's available there. Um, basically, Shajir wrote a plugin within that software that would interact with the API of the electronic lab notebook and would upload all the metadata um, that it can extract from the recorded data. And then you can go with into the electronic lab notebook page and add, for example, free text information or add the, um, I can show you, or add also, or edit, sorry, I should say edit the, where is my, okay, this is my electronic lab notebook. I need to go to editing and then I can actually modify, which is something that, well, you shouldn't be modifying your data um, necessarily. So uh, there is pro and cons, but there may be some fields that are not set or that are not set properly. And um, with, with versioning of these files, you can then also make sure that you can always revert to the original one that has been uploaded. But you can now go in here um, and um, I say, okay, this calibration should not be in nanometers um, because there was something wrong with my instrument. And I'm now changing this to meters. Um, and it's now, sorry, and it's now meters, right? And I can save it. And I've just changed the calibration of my instrument, okay, which is yeah. not necessarily what you want, but. It's if you have versioning of your data, uh, it may actually be quite uh, useful. Right. So, so the way you have apparently uh, um, provided the solution is by uh, writing a script that is reading this metadata, putting it into a JSON file, and there you can re-edit it and change yes. it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
and tomorrow we will see uh, specific use cases uh, for this kind of stuff and uh, information comes from one end or from another file and how uh, it can go into a common scheme afterwards uh, we will have demonstrations of this kind uh, tomorrow thank you for the question uh, next question comes from andreas uh, pinnike again i'm interested into in authentication and authorization in this elab ftw especially if you're using the api to access uh, the data via Jupyter. It yes. was not obvious for me how this is done. Yeah, and I, I've hidden that uh, from you, but I'm, I, I can show you. Um, so there is, um, that's why I actually it, it appended my initials to this library because I hard coded my specific user um, universal ID that is um, actually associated with all these different entries. Um, how coded that in this library um, because I'm showing this publicly. Normally, I would actually just enter this key into my Jupyter notebook and uh, would be able to change it to anybody's key. But then you would be able to read my key and have access to all my data. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yes, it's actually quite safe. Um, particularly, Elab FTW actually has quite high security standards and has. Um, you know, there's this, I forgot what the service is that checks uh, the vulnerability of web pages and they actually get a quite mm. good score. Yeah, especially since there are often already authentication systems at the different institutions, then it's nice if one can combine them somehow. That's ah. one of, if I think about the second talk, this was one of the systems which is usually present. Yeah, so um, we, we have not uh, done this yet. Um, you should actually check with the Elab FTW website if you're interested in that. Mm. Um, they can, they have different ways of authentication. Okay. Um, but I'm not an expert in this, so I don't want to say anything else okay. um, because I might be wrong. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Andreas, for the question, and thank you, uh, Christoph, for all the answers. Indeed, there is uh, one more question I see in the chat. Uh, which is asking about uh, is there any ELN which would support provenance tracking of samples and processes? Uh, this pretty much sounds like a synthesis question. And indeed, tomorrow we will have two use cases uh, addressing uh, this question how, in a synthesis laboratory, uh, you can deal with uh, having. Uh, processes and experimental characterization uh, steps one after the, uh, the another and still try to uh, keep track of what's going on and uh, i'm inviting all of you uh, for the uh, for the tutorial tomorrow starting at either at 10 o'clock or at 4 p.m you are very well uh, very warm welcome and let's meet tomorrow and see uh, the answers to all these questions uh, Jose Marquez uh, will speak about setting up an ELAB FDW for a simple laboratory, answering exactly these questions. Then Shajil will speak about integrating ELAB FDW and NOMAD, and Marcus Schergen will demonstrate uh, NOMAD ELN, ELN features integrating uh, into NOMAD. Thank you for showing it again, uh, Christoph, and see you all tomorrow.